Hey everyone, we are taking over this week's episode of the Financial Confessions to give you a free episode of our new members only podcast. It's about the money, a real housewives podcast. In this show, Aaron Lowry, AKA Broke Millennial and I are deep diving into all things real housewives and money from businesses to real estate, to divorces, to scams and everything in between. In addition to all of our other pre-existing member perks, we are doing all kinds of exclusive podcast series all throughout the year. We have this one on the real housewives. We're doing one on sex in the city. We're covering money and relationships. We're doing the influencer economy and plenty of other amazing exclusive content. If you're not already a member and want to listen to more episodes of It's About the Money and our other members only podcast, just hit the join button below or go to our Patreon linked in the description. And if you're already a member, well, enjoy. Anyway, enjoy this show and we'll see you back here next week for an all new episode of the Financial Confessions. Please don't tell me it's about the money. It's about the money. Welcome to It's About the Money, a Real Housewives podcast deep diving into all things Real Housewives and money. We're talking scams, jail sentences, bankruptcies, divorce, real estate, fake businesses, and everything in between. Let's get into it. So this episode is brought to you by a Spotify playlist featuring all the Real Housewives singles, which actually several of them do exist. Highly recommend going and searching for them. Now, depending on how you want to count it, we have been blessed with quite literally hundreds of businesses ranging from established to credible to attempts to scams across all 11 domestic Real Housewife franchises, including Ultimate Girls Trip. Now, for those who were not watching in 2006 when Real Housewives of Orange County dropped for the very first time, It featured the OG of the OC herself, Vicki Gumvelson, working out of her home office. Now, Vicki founded and still runs Coto Insurance and Financial Services. She is one of the few housewives who came into the show with an established, credible business and remained working in the same field to this day. Now, of course, Bethany Frankel is probably the most well-known businesswoman to come out of any Real Housewives franchise. Early seasons portray her as an aspiring entrepreneur with a background working as a natural food chef trying to launch her business, Skinny Girl. The pre-made low-calorie margarita was the flagship product, and eventually she sold Skinny Girl cocktails for an estimated $100 million. And she kept the brand name Skinny Girl, which launched into a ton of different products, including, I think most hilariously, jeans. Which she did take pains to say on the show was accessible to all body types, despite being called skinny girl jeans. Yes, it was size inclusive. I uh, have some strong feelings about the level of inclusivity that was actually part of that jean line. Oh, we'll get to Bethany. Please finish your (laughs) intro. Now, all of the success serves as inspiration to what is technically achievable for housewives, but it also created the quote, Bethany Clause. Essentially, most housewives have included in their contracts a clause that they are required to give a portion of their business profits to the network if that business is promoted on the show. Now, I'm just going to take a wild guess that Vicki Gumbleson has a Vicky clause that Kodo Insurance does not have to give any money to Bravo, but that's just my guess. The network is giving the housewife and their businesses a national platform, and then the housewife in kind owes Bravo a portion of the revenue. Now, classic Real Housewives seasons, by which I mean old, still featured women coming on in large part to promote their businesses and brands, like uh, one Heather Thompson with Yummy Tummy. Holla! (laughs) These days, the Real Housewives... Deck me, mama. (laughs) (laughs) I think we... What did she retire, Holla? Like season her third season I think she literally <laughs> retired it as her last act as well so she's like I think that's done by the way that Diddy connection aged like Ooh, milk <laughs> very <laughs> much so continue these days the real housewife business model feels more influencer at best and grifter at worst and we are not even getting into things like cameos and merch now listen I want these women launching products or services in order to better capitalize on the Bravo platform and their fame to succeed. I want them to get theirs and make some money, but some level of discretion is necessary. Okay, so we got to get into this by first and foremost, kind of delineating on the show, which you sort of teed up nicely in your, by the way, vastly more professional than most of these businesses (laughs) intro to this episode which is the businesses 
um, that are by all, and it's not even a question of how much money they make. I think there are businesses that are at least a sincere attempt at doing something. And then there are ones that are complete cash grabs. And I'm gonna, we're not even gonna discuss whether or not they ever materialize, because that's its own segment and we'll get to that later. Because some things, maybe they were, you know, real attempts, but we just never saw them come to fruition. But then there are a lot of them which, where the vibes are sort of like, we're on TV, let's make something of this. Uh, things that come to mind are things like um, the candle business that Jim and Megan King Edmonds started on OC. We have so many candle businesses. But who so is many. like, I want the former like third baseman <laughs> of the of the St. Louis Cardinals on his fourth marriage with his 17 children to sell me a three wick candle. Who's out there saying that? I also love that it was positioned like he was the mastermind behind the candles. Like he was the candle boy. He was the candle man. But as much as there have been businesses that have been hugely transparent grabs for cash, we have also got a pretty good track record of the either established or pre-existing businesses or businesses that achieved a certain level of legitimacy on the show. They existed for at least a few years. So let's shout them out. The aforementioned Koto Insurance and the aforementioned Skinny Girl. But we also have Zarin Fabrics, which famously, according to Jill Zarin, <laughs> existed for, uh, I believe, 100 years. It's got to be coming yes. up on a 100-year anniversary. I think it, was, it came in the, the 30s. It was her, obviously, uh, the late Bobby Zarin's uh, family business. Um, on the Lower East Side here in New York City, we have Kenya Moore Hair Care. Although with the edit that they give her almost never showing it, you sort of think that Bravo doesn't want that to succeed. I did double check. It is very much still in business oh, it is. and doing very well. Uh, Beauty Lab and Laser, Vita Tequila, owned famously by a Mormon, um, Go Naked Hair, True Faith Jewelry. Uh, but that was Mario's family business. So although Ramona breathed new life into it with the show, we do have to clarify that. And of course, uh, the infamous Envy by Melissa Gorga. And I went down a rabbit hole to confirm that not only is it still open and people are still going into this boutique store, which one of the few brick and mortars to survive, I might add. Is Posh still around? I do not believe Posh um, is still real-time around. Real-time journalism is happening. <laughs> but Melissa has opened another location. Posh which... by Kim D. Open oh. online. OK. I no don't think we count it. Mortar. I say yes. Also, <laughs> hilariously, when you Google where it is, the Google Street View is all of the United States. <laughs> Which means she's only shipping in the U.S. is what I'm going to conclude that to mean. I think that's what that means. Um, but anyway, so we have, basically we have the businesses that are legitimate businesses, whether or not they existed prior to the housewife joining the show. Um, and then we have, uh, within those businesses, we have a few main categories. What are they? So I'm going to start with the brick and mortar attempts. So I know we just gave her some props, but we have to bring up Gorga's Pizza and Pasta, AOA, which that was Ramona's sort of attempt at a restaurant. I don't even know what really so, happened there. Unfortunately, as I mentioned on, on our pilot episode, um, I, I have been deep into a, a Roni rewatch. Um, I miss my girls and I fear I'm never getting them back. So we're dipping into the archives. Um, so you see the whole, his name is Peter and his whole arc plays out on the show. He comes on um, to start uh, Tipsy Girl, which we will discuss. Um, well, Tipsy, I think, happened after AOA. Because we're you we are like, right. Oh, you are wait, correct. Peter, the same AOA guy. Is, <laughs> AOA is season seven with Ramona, and then Tipsy Girl is season eight. But I, I should just note that uh, Peter, uh, in addition to being a bit of a scam artist, kind of all around, uh, unsuccessfully ran for mayor of New York in 2020. Oh, man. Also, Scamming at different levels. He got to go to Bluestone Manor as Ramona's kind of date that one time. I don't remember which episode. That greasy, greasy man. But to continue on, Kyle Richards Boutique Clothing Store. Lauren Kyle Manzo's, by Aline too. <laughs> Lauren Manzo's Salon Cafe. I don't even, Cafe. I don't remember how we pronounce Cafe. that. <laughs> Peter Thomas's Bar One and Cynthia Bailey's Modeling Agency. Now I'm including Peter Thomas's Bar One in here because Cynthia Bailey famously was footing the bill for most of Bar One. And Ashley Darby's Australian themed restaurant Oz. Then we've got your product-based businesses, which I would say is really the most prolific category here. Your Tipsy Girls, Robin Dixon's Hatline Embellished, Rinna Beauty, or Rinna Beauty Lip Kits, Wendy and Karen's Two and or Three Wick Candles. There's also Tiffany Moon, I believe, of Dallas, because this is probably the only time we're going to reference Dallas, also has a candle. Kenya and Phaedra's competing workout videos, and Dorit's Beverly Beachwear. Now, um... 
you know, technically still a product, but I'm going to put it in a category of its own. You've got the Real Housewives turned authors. More than 40 Real Housewives have published books over the years, some of which predates the housewife actually joining the cast, but we're still going to count it. And then finally, we have been given the utter delights of singing housewives. And there are way more singles than you think, especially quite a few that were never even featured on the show. And I would recommend everyone right now pause us and do yourself a favor and go find Simon Van Kempen's I Am Real single. Okay. I, first of all, love that song. (laughs) It's in heavy rotation. But I have to say my favorite of the lesser known, the B-sides of the Real Housewives um, musical of is um, the song that Danielle uh, from New Jersey made with that woman. It was, like, yes. it was like, it was like almost spoken word. It was like, oh, real close. We're getting real close. Danielle and Kim both had flirtations with, I believe they were like lesbian DJs who then they were like, oh, well, are they, aren't they? You're referring to Kim from Atlanta, not a Kim on, yes. on not Jersey. Kim D. Yes. Or Kim Kim from Atlanta. (laughs) Too many Kims. And, uh, you know, finally, this is a separate category we'll discuss a little bit, but the ghost businesses, by which I mean things that were referenced a gajillion times and never got made, such as Sonia Morgan's toaster oven. R.I.P. to the toaster oven that never was. Okay, I let's as a as authors ourselves. Yes, I think we have to give special special attention to the housewives books because I've read a few. In my day, have you? Same, yeah. Now, what, which ones have you read? I was listening to some of Heather Gay's Bad Mormon. It's a decent audio book. I've heard that's good. Yeah, it is pretty good. Also, Bethany Frankel has a novel called Skinny Dipping. Stop. I'm not kidding. The title is in smaller font than her name on the cover. Okay, well, I have one of the Housewives books that I've read is Naturally Thin by Bethany Frankel. I still own it. It's in my that's storage cursed. unit. Yeah. Um it That's the so horror cursed. crux if I've ever heard of one. Okay, so as we're filming this, well, recording this, um, she had been recently like going viral a little bit on TikTok, like as usual in a, in a negative way, um, because someone had like, I guess, asked her like, what's your secret to staying thin? And I mean, listen, we're not here to armchair diagnose, but I think we all know what her secrets to staying thin are. But anyway, she shared a lot of tips that were basically like, um, never eat till you're full taste everything but eat nothing um just like a lot of um a lot of i'll I'll generously refer to it as food strategizing and of Mm. course the conversation this sparked mostly amongst people who i think are not terribly familiar with bethany frankel was like who is this very scary looking woman on here giving people advice for how to have an eating disorder and me who bought skinny like naturally thin the year it came out and read that shit when i was maybe at my most vulnerable i was like haha it seems that we are only now learning what she recommends to do one of her tips from that book that i'll never forget is when you go to a restaurant first of all eat before eat your like pre-planned meal before so that you're not hungry when you go to the restaurant Order something at the restaurant that is extremely low calorie and you can eat as much of as you want. The thing you really want to eat, order it, but intentionally either ask them to portion it as a as a shared plate or cut yourself a piece and then immediately start passing it around the table so that as many people as possible can eat it and you only get one bite of it. That's one of her tips. The amount of biting my own lips I had to just do while you were explaining that entire thing. When did that book come out? What year? 2010, I want to say. Okay. Nine. Because, speaking of a Roni rewatch, I was inspired while working on this episode. It's only seven episodes the first season, so I've just had it on the background. And she gets her three book deal at the end. Like, that's her little Mm -hmm. summary thing at the end Mm -hmm. of season one. So I was wondering if it was part of that. It must have been. I think it was. Also, on that note, one of the, I've read both of Carol Radziwill's books with regards to Ghost Rider Gate, for those who remember it. This is my take as someone, as one of the maybe 10 people who's read both What Remains and Widow's Guide. If you read those two books, it is inconceivable that they were written by the same person. But uh, yeah, one of my favorite controversies actually is, did Carol have a ghostwriter? Here's the thing I want to be clear about. The, the line between, I think they made so much, and I'm really jazzed up about this because I just watched this. I think they made so much hash about 
how different it is to have a ghostwriter versus extremely heavy editing. And I would very heavily argue that in the process of a celebrity ghostwritten, because I have not at the level of a full, full length book, but I have ghostwritten before. And there are many different levels to which the person can be involved. And I actually think that the line does start to get a little blurry at a certain point. Um, I will only say that if you take the time to, I mean, just read a couple chapters, read what remains. It is a beautiful, beautiful piece of writing. And also, I mean, probably the most compelling subject you could possibly imagine. Widow's Guide just seems like, how was this written by the same person? That's all I can say. No, which is fair. Also, very much agree on there's heavy-handed editing, there's book doctoring, which is just sort of punching it up. Right. And then there's full-blown ghostwriting. And if we're being honest, I need most of these memoirs to be ghostwritten. Most, not Carol's, but most of the housewives. I would prefer a professional writer. Let's get a professional in the room. Writing. And what I really take issue with more than anything is at one point in defending herself. Now listen, if I were put on the spot and accused of something I didn't do, I'd be flailing too. But at one point, she makes the point of having a scene with her editor uh, at the imprint I was uh, also at. She makes a scene of, 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 you know, being like, you know how I am with editing. If you change more than two letters, you have to give me a phone call. Now, as Ooh. we've both published many a book in our day. <laughs> That's a lot of calls. That's a lot of phone calls, but also that that almost literally makes no sense. There's no way. There's just no way. No, no, that's a ridiculous sentence. But I will say also in defense of her, when my first book came out, I was at a conference and somebody that I know asked me, oh, did you write it yourself or did you have it ghostwritten? And I that was a gut punch to me. Yeah. The idea that people thought that someone else had written my book. Also, it's just a blow to your ego because you like to think that you're the only one who can do it. Ghostwriters are very good at their job. They can mimic yeah. anyone's tone. So they definitely could have. But I was so heartbroken when someone asked me that. Yes. And so very much in defense of Carol. I understand going from zero to 60 when accused. Totally. And kind of was the only thing she had. Well, okay. But then the other thing where the math isn't mathing, though, is that you and I, again, who have published multiple books, like we're still putting out a lot of output. Whereas with Carol... We wrote these books in theory, (laughs) and then as the seasons progress, I mean, most of them, we're just not working at all, but then maybe once a season or once every other season, there's a major plot line that centers around Carol needing to submit a 500 word article to a magazine, and we're throwing parties for it when they're finished. And it takes her months. And it takes her months. Months. Now, I will say, because I feel like we jumped to a controversy, and I, I want to tie back to one thing that I feel so strongly and so passionately about, and that is... If you're going to promote a product, like a book, say, on the show, but more famously, you know, candles, athleisure, whatever, for the love of God, it better be to market by the time the episode airs. The amount of these women who are out here trying to pitch a product to us, the consumer, and then it doesn't exist, so I can't go buy it, which I'm going to be honest, I don't buy most of their products, but on occasion, it seems interesting they're leaving so much money on the table. I would think that's the cardinal sin of housewife marketing on these shows. Well, I mean, here's the thing, though. Whether it's the brick and mortar or the physical product, where I'm at a loss with this is, like, I do consider myself a fairly savvy business person. I would never get it. I can't have SKUs. I can't be running logistics. Like, I can't be warehousing products. Like, sometimes they even are selling, like, in the case of, like, jewels with her, like, you know, modern alchemy, like, ginger shot shit. Like, this is perishable. Like, we're talking about real meaningful logistical operations. And that just seems like if we're going from nothing at all ever, in the case of many of these women, they've never had a job outside the home, to that's got to be one of the highest barriers to entry is suddenly doing logistics at the scale of thousands of sales a quarter. Which is also why I have absolutely no shade to anyone who chooses to just kind of slap their name or their yeah, whatever the on, play. Yeah, just on a product like that or partner with a business. Because yes, I don't want to do any of that work. No, that's and so on much. the licensing front. And not to take it back to Skinny Girl, but I will. What is going on with Skinny Girl as a brand? Because I have never seen a Skinny Girl product outside of that really weird dystopian clearance aisle at a TJ Maxx or a Home Goods. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. <laughs> it's like all these like random drop shipped popcorns from like I just recently Eastern Europe. <laughs> went to a Marshalls in a very small town in Western New York, and I got to tell you guys though, if you have access to a small very small city or a small town, Marshalls or TJ Maxx, those aisles can be littered with gems because 
People are not picking through them in the same way that they do in larger markets. I got so much good facial care there because no one's buying the good brands that are there. Anyway, <laughs> back to the show. Hot um, tips for you New York City people. <laughs> so we need to dig into a few specific businesses. Um, and Erin, I know you have some thoughts here. You know, speaking of New York, I feel like let's just start with our girl, Luann. Because. My mother, my sister, <laughs> my best friend. You know, I sorry, I just have to say this. You saw obviously like she slept with that dude from Southern Hospitality. Yes, when Joe on Bradley. Watching, Joe Bradley, who is so hot. Me and Mark watched that TikTok recounting the whole story. Mark has a huge crush on Luann, my husband. And I was like, I looked him dead in the eye and I was like, if you get the chance to sleep with Luann, you do it. <laughs> you, you take do it chance. for the family. <laughs> anyway. You bring that home. I love her. Well, I think it's important for us to also disclose right up top that we have gone to see Countess Luann's sure cabaret have. show. Um, I smoked a cigarette with one Jacques Azoulay. It was great. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> Not inside, of course. This is New York City. We don't do that here. No, no, We're no. Outside on the sidewalk with In our dignity. Our <laughs> martinis and French fries. It was a perfect entract. It was wonderful. Now, obviously, she's been through a lot. I also think that the season, oh, was it nine? When her head was so big, Cabaret was mentioned five times an episode, every episode. Yeah. It must have been. No, ten. 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 Because it was after the arrest. It was like we we were arrested and the next day we were on that stage. Yes. Which, honestly, good for her. Within reason. I'm not saying drinking, but I'm saying (laughs) that she (laughs) kept working. And I think it was a good distraction through everything she was going through. But I have a lot of respect for the cabaret show. I really do. Oh, I thought it was delightful. I thought it was delightful. Also, my most problematic, and I know we've discussed this, but like, so there are a lot of housewives where I'm like, you gotta, you gotta get off television. You gotta get off the sauce. Like, you gotta get off a lot of things. With Luann, like, on Ultimate Girls Trip this time, she was so delightful. Yeah, it's a real mixed, <laughs> it's a bag. mixed bag. Unfortunately, most of our housewives are just more entertaining when on <laughs> when off the wax substance. <laughs> but with Luann, it's just with Luann. What's so interesting about her to me as a person is that like we swing to such extremes mm. on every single level. And one thing that's notable about her cabaret show is like, you know, we both do a lot of events. They are no joke. And the amount that she is traveling, producing, rehearsing, like even if the rehearsals aren't that intense, like even just the logistics of it, like this woman produces and gets out there, whereas I feel like so many of them, there's just not that, there's no follow through. And Luann, for as chaotic as she's been, it seems like she follows through. I do very much agree that she follows through. Like Mm. I think pretty much everything... Except maybe like the chunky statement necklace line that she did like a co-licensing deal with back when those were, I guess they're coming back. But in the original incarnation of the chunky necklace, she did have some sort of weird deal around that. But when it comes to the cabaret show, she also keeps it fresh. It is not her touring the exact same show that she's been doing from the very Mm -hmm. beginning. If you went to her early ones, which unfortunately we were not at like the earliest incarnation of this show. But she also had on a lot of, like, well-known New York City talent. Like, oh, Bridget yeah. Everett, Rachel Dratch was at one of them. Like, that's really going out and doing the work to, like, get the other people there. Totally. And I think she... Listen, did she stop speaking to Barbara after she made a reference to her not totally being able to sing? Apparently, they've reconciled as of a little bit ago. Okay, I'm happy to hear that. Also, (laughs) wasn't that another mayoral candidate? Yes, she was. I literally, you say this, this morning while getting ready, I was listening to Barbara was just on a podcast and talked about Luann. What did she say? I think reconciled, which I just said, is a bit strong of a word for what she described. But basically, they're at peace. Okay. But point being, with that as kind of the exception to the rule, I feel like Luann is fairly self-aware of the fact that she is not a Broadway singer, but she's doing what she does best, which is putting on a show, and then she brings in a support team to do some fun other things with her. And here's the thing. We've both been in the room with that woman. Just her walking in is a show. Like, that body's a show. That body is a show. Giovanni, let's go. Let's hear it for Giovanni. And what's so incredible to me, so again, deep in my rewatch, and not to go back to like whether Luann should be drinking or not, because I think that's a complicated issue, but what's so remarkable to me, I mean, I'm 35 years old. If I have three plus martinis in an evening, 
that whole next day is written off, maybe the one after that at this point. We have so many episodes that we can go back to of Luann. Now, I know a lot of this is cocaine, but <laughs> we have so many episodes. Allegedly, like, allegedly. We, we all remember the fall into the bushes. Mm. What few remember is that the next morning, she was up at 7.30 on a surfboard. Fresh as a daisy. Fresh as a daisy. I got to say, the recovery time on almost all of the New York housewives, Beverly Hills, Sometimes can compete, but not Sometimes. quite. But as I think well. they're getting. I think they're pretending to get drunker than they are, especially like Arena and Erica, et Beverly Hills, to seem relatable and charming. Oh, New York is fully getting wasted. Oh, for sure, yes. for sure. Which, by the way, can we give a quick shout out before we move on um, from New York to um, to just one of the unsung heroes of the New York City businesses, Madame Paulette's. Okay. Again, the, if I rewatch the amount that I actually want to take something there, I just want to. So, what was always shocking to me was that when Dorinda would go visit him, and he's just at a desk in the dry cleaning like store, and then on top of it, they were often like throwing like little parties at the dry cleaners. Uh, maybe it's a cleaner huge space. Parties. And where is is it in Queens? Upper East, so, uh, let me tell you he's because I Queens. looked this up. So he is for sure in Queens, but. Um, the, like the, the main location or like the, the front facing location is in the Upper East Side and that's where their clientele comes. But they have like a, a warehouse treatment center where they, I guess, deal with like the major stains or whatever, or like the big pieces in, uh, I think it's in Long Island City. Okay. Queens. Queens. To further clarify, not Long Island. Confusing name. But it was just always so funny that it was like, oh, I, you know, we have to go to this like glamorous fashion event at, at the dry cleaners. <laughs> And then Luann's Ibiza boyfriend shows up. <laughs> okay. You're talking about my man, Ray. Who, by the way, like, I there was a while where I was just, like, following his Instagram. Ray has a child now. That's someone's dad. Oh, no. Ooh, what do you mean, right. you bitch? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, moving on to uh, a different franchise. This we can just uh, do a couple of sentences on because I haven't quite figured out Sutton's store. Oh, I think it's a tax. So loop. what Sutton's store is to me is a subgenre of business unto itself. We can also add in like an Erica Jane situation, probably a lot of the the Dallas girlies, whatever. Where these are complete vanity operations that are being bankrolled by either an active spouse or an ex spouse. It has to be. There's no way. Or is there a world in which that's some sort of really good tax write-off? I it's so hard to say, but Erin, I bet you those PLs are a disaster zone. Well, and There's also just no way because she's now outside of the IRS rule on something being a hobby versus a business. I will also say so. To clarify for listeners, you can only go three years of operating at a loss for it to be considered a business, and then the IRS is like, "No, that's cute. This is now a hobby." You do not get your credits. Right. Now, I'm sure if you're many, many, many times over a millionaire, maybe there's some sort of zhuzhing that can happen. Right. But also for those who are maybe not Beverly Hills watchers or are not caught up, Sutton receives, I believe she specified post-tax. $300,000 a month. In alimony. Per month. Okay, this is where I'm like, this is a mental illness to be on this show. Because if someone is just writing you a post-tax check for three and a half million dollars a year, why would your ass ever be on television? I don't know. And I have to admit, I do like Sutton. I've gone back and forth on whether I like her. And I, I like currently her. do. I like her. But let me tell you about Sutton. To me, she's one of those housewives. So as whereas Luann, I'm like, well, maybe Luann's just a fun time girl. Sutton, along with some of the others, is one of those ones where I'm like, ooh, I think we're only seeing just a, a, bare, a barely the surface level of the darkness that lies beneath, you know? Yes, but she does just give some marvelous one-liners like, Teddy, I thought you were going to be a little boring. And then I found out you were pregnant. And I God was help like, us. Oh, God help us. Which I mean, she ain't wrong. I say that to a pregnant woman. <laughs> rude <laughs> no you're right. i'm a delight you're a delightful pregnant woman i have to say uh but some of them not so much um okay so listen the time has come uh our new segment defend a candy <laughs> okay we're talking about candy on both sides of this because we're gonna wrap up on the positives and get to the controversies because we know that's what everybody's here for now I'll start as the defender and i think you to a degree have to agree with some of this that 
She is a very successful businesswoman at the end of the day. Oh, no one's disputing that. So that's first things. Candy, I feel, is one of the number one hustlers, and I mean that in the most positive of ways. It's about to get spun into a negative by you in a minute. It sure is. But what I respect about what she does, one, she diversifies. Totally. And we've seen that from the jump. So not only, even within her musical genres, you know, she was a singer, then pivoted to songwriting, ended up with a Grammy, no scrubs, for those who do not know, then also had kind of diversified what kind of music she was writing Mm -hmm. at various points, wanted to dabble in country very early on. A lot of pop hits. A lot of pop, getting into R&B, kind of all over the place. But then, on top of that, just with her business portfolio, makes good real estate investments, I can't speak to the restaurants, but they are still operating. Famously, Keith Lee went to her, uh, went to Old Lady Gang recently. And? Was there a review? Um, Like many of the Atlanta stops he made, um, pretty horrendous service, I think, was the Mm. takeaway. Chaotic. I mean, I think he also went on like a Sunday brunch, which I imagine is their busiest time. That, yeah, that feels like it's going to be tough. Yeah. And... I also just, my continued deep appreciation for her is that she does talk about money on the show in a way that I feel very few housewives do. Correct. And she talks about her businesses. She also will talk about her failures. She has taken many shows on the road. She's currently producing Broadway. And I think it's interesting. I also think it's interesting to watch her navigate with her husband what is an individual project, Mm -hmm. what is a shared project. The fact that she was like, okay, Todd wants to write and direct movies now. Go ahead and let him. But you know what we're going to use? We're going to use our house as the set so we don't have to pay to go shoot this somewhere. Listen, I'm loath to be on the same side of an issue as Mama Joyce, but I don't trust Todd, so. That's fine. I'm sure they have an ironclad prenup. Oh, I'm sure. I will say also, in Candy's defense as a, a real housewife, and this is why I always, like, because you know, obviously, we have all the lo- the lawsuits coming out about, like, we were all forced to drink and whatnot. I'm like, Candy Burris has given sober. us... A- a sober Sally. And I don't even think she's sober. I think she like has a drink like once a year or something. But either way, she has given us, what, 11 seasons, 12 mm-hmm. seasons of nonstop storylines. A little bit less these past few. But in general, she has been a, an A-list housewife, delivering, firing on all cylinders, being at the parties, showing up, doing everything, giving us storylines. Never drinks. So I really don't buy the idea. And like, even when we look back at like Jill Zarin, I mean, in her time, gave us some of the most compelling storylines of the entire franchise. Also doesn't Famously drink. just occasionally, but like yeah. g- generally Diet Coke. So I do feel like Candy also represents, because like especially toward the end of New York, that was getting hard to watch. And I do feel like Candy represents a kind of housewife. I would even put Tamara in this, in this, honestly, where you're like, you're giving us television at an elite level and it does not seem to be completely robbing you of your mental and physical health. Well, I think what's interesting about it is Candy knows how to produce yes. without it feeling produced in a way that I would say she's the opposite of Kyle Richards. Totally. I feel like Kyle is doing a little too much producing and manipulating of things on that show where Candy's just like, I know what buttons to push. Boop, boop. The only time we ever really saw her go off was at um, Pillow Talk. Yes. There's a lot of speculation on this. Also, recent season, she had a showdown at an event with a new... Wasn't it with one of the new castmates? Who basically was trying to claim that she knew her and Candy's like, I don't know you. And it it escalated kind of quickly. And I... Again, though, I respect the fact that she's talked about it on the show. That she's like, I don't really drink because I don't need to to get to an 11 and so I know myself well enough to not do this and again I think provides an example that people can be accountable for their own decisions Mm -hmm. actually Barbara was talking about that in an interview because he was asking her about the Leah and Bethany lawsuits and she was like listen I was at all those parties I was I was responsible for myself and I knew that I was on television and I knew and she was like but I do think there are a lot of people who have issues going in Mm -hmm. and this totally exacerbates it which is true okay now what I'm going to say against Candy the girl's running an MLM to sell sex toys. And the sex toys aside, we're a sex-positive house. No no shade at all to that, but not in an MLM. It's a great business to be in. Like, that was a smart diversification. MLMs? Move. No, no. Oh. Sex toys. <laughs> not MLMs. It's like, who are you and what have you done with Aaron? But to get into the sex toy business, I thought was a genius move on her sure. part. Because she had candy-coated nights already. She talks about sex a lot on the show. A little much She's for my taste. very sex-positive to a very intense degree. And... 
initially it was a really good idea. I don't know why it needed to be structured in a recruit style manner for the sellers or that it even needed to go to sellers, distributors. That's the term, right? Distributors? What is the term? I think it's distributors. Yeah. I I don't know why she had to go that route because surely it was going to sell well on its own. I mean, I think MLMs are just, I think there's a really, when you are a public figure who has a lot of fans, the community aspect of it, I think, is such an obvious fit. And it's a very fine line, I think, for a lot of people between I'm an evangelist of the product and I'm like a seller of the product. Um, so I could see, I, I can see why a lot of people with very large public platforms and communities would, would do that, even though it's obviously wrong. But get them an affiliate link and move on. Move on. Okay, but we cannot talk about MLMs without talking about maybe the darkest MLM to have ever been conceived because at least in some cases you're selling leggings or candles or oils. In this case, you're selling eating disorders. Yeah. That's all in by Teddy Mellencamp. Very dark, especially because most of her plot line in the early years was about the fact that she had weighed 200 pounds and then got skinny. So it was like her two talking points were, I don't want to talk about my, my dad's John, don't call me Cougar Mellencamp, and also... I lost a crap ton of weight and I'm still really militant about working out even when I'm on vacation. The thing about Teddy that darks me out to such an extreme extent is like for a lot of them, you do have a sense that we're like we're watching like we're playing out our traumas on this show and we're not even like I mean, I know that like Bethany, for example, who also dabbles in monetizing disordered eating to an extraordinary extent, like at least we had it you know, Amador on the show every now and again to like pay lip service to being like, hey, maybe some of this has to do with your crazy upbringing. Do you know what I mean? Like there was like a level of like, okay, well, mental health maybe plays a role. The theme of All In, which for those who don't know, is it's essentially like an MLM where you join an accountability group in the form of essentially an MLM where you can work with coaches who basically like bully you into staying on like a 500 calorie a day diet. One of them like leaked a recipe that was literally a leaf of lettuce with two mandarin slices and a slice of red onion as a taco. And, you know, I mean, steps like you got to chew your food a lot, like drown everything in like hot sauce and spices and whatever. Like, I mean, just very classic, like you might have learned this at, in like a dorm or something kind of ED advice. Well, even as the launcher of Puppygate, mm. it like you should have gotten all this notoriety of being one of the players and one of the biggest moments in Beverly Hills history. And even that, I'm like, the thing that got famous was... Bye, Kyle. <laughs> I know. Well, and also there's something about her personality type to me that there's like, I, you know, we both, we love a bitch. We love a meanie. We love a, a, you know, a bad person on these shows. What I can't stand is a bad person who doesn't own their badness. Oh, and who says, I don't lie. Oof. That was a tough one. You remember? Okay. This is a, such a small moment, but it, it truly like got under my skin in such, such a profound way when during the Denise scene where they were, you know, I mean, so many layers to how terrible it was to just be like outing her on television for supposedly having sex with a woman. But there was like one point at like, at a dinner, I think in Rome, when Denise was like, we could just like put this aside and you know, whatever. And Teddy's like, I mean, I I guess I can be friends with you. I don't know if I can trust you. I'm like, no one even wants you on this show. <laughs> like, Get out of here. Um, so at least Candy in all of her MLMery is like a deeply likable and aspirational figure on the show. Well, she's a great housewife. Yeah, yeah. and like, and she's selling a dream. Mm-hmm. Where's Teddy? She's selling a dream. She also is, she bears a lot. Like she has given us a lot of behind the scenes Candy. access. Candy has. Yes. Teddy gave us nothing. A lot of them give us nothing, if we're being honest. But the fact that we have seen the Mama Joyce and Todd fights, that we have seen her and Mama Joyce fight, that we have seen just a lot of things of like their family dynamic that most people I think would want to shield from the public. And she's been very open. I think she has to be recognized as a top five all-time housewife. I'd have to run my numbers. I'll get back to you. (laughs) Um, Okay. So when it comes to the businesses that never were, Uh, I think we cannot leave this segment without just giving a quick shout out to joggers, spring, summer, September. She by Sheree. 
Sheen by Sheree or she by Sheree? Ooh, that is the big question. The question on everyone's <laughs> minds. A fashion show with no fashions. How dreadful. It's so dreadful. I've seen him too in real life. Get out! Dwight, yep. Get out. Looks um, exactly in real life like he looked on television. The thing about she by Sheree that's always so compelling to me is like it really does show the sort of inertia of being on television for long enough that like you can have a fake business for so long on TV that eventually a decade a decade later maybe a real business will emerge <laughs> you know now that I, I have to recant my former statement of the toaster oven being the most famous example because she by Sheree is really the most famous example of a fashion show with no fashions we did not have anything to sell now ultimately she has brought something hoodies to market um, not I think ever the dream that was being sold um, and in Sonia's credit to go to her, her fashions did exist for a while, mm-hmm. fleeting and dropshippy as they were, they did exist. But I, to me, the toaster oven still reigns supreme for fake businesses because there was never a toaster oven, whereas with She by Sheree, we did eventually get these hoodies 10 years later. We did. Which, um, like, I'm, I'm like, girl, do you not know about, like, ca- cafe, pr- like, print, printful or whatever? Like, you could have had hoodies day one. <laughs> like, I could have hoodies today. The toaster oven also gave us one of the most iconic photo shoots we've ever seen across any franchise there were two are you talking about the one where she's like spread eagle on her table well weren't those those were two different setups in the same no 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 those no, no. Are two different this shoots. is a an under respected aspect of the toaster oven lore in season four she's doing a photo shoot is that the one in the red dress at home yes where kelly comes by okay. and sees her vagina because heather then is helping on the later one <laughs> and <laughs> that whole by the way i have to say what's actually from a businesswoman perspective and from just like a like a a woman who has her shit together perspective, which I know you always respect. Where do you land on Heather Holla Thompson? How do you like her? You know what? This is a hard. This is a hard one for me. I have to kind of take a deep breath because there was a lot that I did like about her. Mm, doesn't shock me, <laughs> <laughs> including Jonathan, her husband. So many people didn't like Jonathan. I did not like. Jonathan. I love Jonathan. I think he's a nice guy, but he triggers me in a specific way. Okay. I just, it was nice seeing just like a nice guy who just wasn't going to get into the muck on at least one franchise. I just feel like she was so dismissive and rude to him. And I don't like that he didn't stand up to her. Well, that's a horse of a different color, but he just seems like a lovely, affable gentleman. Yes. yes which was a lovely. bit of a breath of fresh considering so much of what we get from these husbands. The husbands of could be their own episode. And they will be. Great. <laughs> that is a must do. I, again, having someone come on who talked a fair amount of real numbers was interesting, but also she, the amount that she was riding her own sort of coattails from earlier on in her career, like name dropping people she had worked with 15 years prior that I don't think would know her name or could pick her out you of You say that, lineup. but at least until recently, she was one of like a very small handful of people that Tina Knowles followed on Instagram. Okay. I stand corrected. You do. <laughs> okay. then, uh, then I love her even more now. Also, her shading Ramona about the thing at the Learning Annex still remains one of my favorite Ramona versus someone else moments and how much she triggered Ramona. Yes. We really got a lot of great Ramona content in those seasons. We did. I will say the thing about, I think the reason, now you're totally right that Jonathan seems like an absolute you know, adorable gentleman taking out her friends to go taste caviar to pick a gift for her. Very, a very sweet, loving man. No, no disrespect. The the aspect of her being sort of mean to him on various occasions and him just being like, okay, sweetie. Like, I'm like, I think that that triggers me because I can be mean to my husband and it's important for him to be like, what is wrong with you? Absolutely not, you know? Um, but I think Heather to me is such a specific type of like, younger Gen X elder millennial Mm. girl boss that like she reminds me so much of like women I used to nanny for who are like super powerful big law attorneys or like you know really high up in some marketing firm or whatever who like they're like holla mama like it's so good to see you like you're crushing it and then you get like four unhinged emails at one in the morning (laughs) because you haven't answered your phone they contain multitudes they do I just I just get the sense that there would be and then that being said I mean there's no one who seems more unhinged to work for than Bethany Frankel oh but listen that's a whole those assistant scenes whole different ball game those assistant scenes and also i feel like she said and kind of did certain things around the assistants and i'm like maybe maybe this is a lawsuit <laughs> literally two days ago or yesterday i was i'm in my rewatch there's a scene where she's packing for a christmas trip i think to the berkshires 
with an assistant who she insults on multiple levels. It's the one where she asks her if she's Jewish. Is it yes. this one? Yes. yes. She literally goes, like, you're her employer. <laughs> she goes, this isn't Santa Claus. What are you? What are you, a Jew? What are you, Jewish? And the girl's like, yeah. And she's like, yeah, this isn't Santa Claus, just so you know. And I was like, and this wasn't, by the way, this wasn't like season one, Roni. No, no. Where anything was flying. This was like three years ago. Very established. I was beyond shocked that this like aired on television recently. Yeah. Yeah. Wild. The other thing I'll say about Heather Thompson. This is going to sound very disrespectful, but when she came on with Yummy Tummy, as a woman who has worn many a Spanx undergarment in her life, I was like, we couldn't get Sarah Blakely? I know. I know. That being said, though, I will say I I did respect, going back to Heather on the business front, that we're talking about a real business that you could buy in stores. I saw that yeah. shit in Macy's all the time. Absolutely. I don't really know what went down that she's no longer associated with the company. We probably should have done a little bit of digging on that before we bringing We can only look up this. so much, guys. It's true. I started trying to chronicle and count every business that had ever been started. And I was like, I don't Aaron's have enough pregnant. time. She doesn't have time for that. <laughs> I don't have time. Even if I wasn't, wouldn't have had time. <laughs> there are so, so many. Also, with regards to just blatantly asking the religion of your employees, one thing that I think just cannot be understated is the degree to which like Salt Lake City as a franchise has just normalized so much just truly deranged discourse and behavior around a variety of religions, honestly. But like you watch that show and you're like, there is just like what we're putting out into the ether here about about Mormonism, about Christianity, about Judaism. Like they're really, I think they're doing an important job to just make all religion look like a laughing stock at this point. And uh, I feel like we can't leave Salt Lake City briefly without mentioning, talk about the mothership of MLMs. Not the show, the city. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Because what do we have? We have Whitney's husband, who was really high up at an MLM. And I think he'd worked at three or four. Yeah. But there are a lot that are associated with Salt Lake City yes. specifically. I'm not going to directly say the Mormon church, but... I will. Certainly directly will. associated with... The, well, I mean, there's a lot of really good deep dives on why Mormonism in particular is such a great fit for MLMs. Yeah. Deuterra being a very famous one. I love, though, that Lisa Barlow still claims Mormonism while owning a tequila Mormon company. Mormon 2.0, baby. I can be... I get your voice. <laughs> that sounded a little more Meredith Marks. I also have to say, Sutton sells Brooks Marks uh, clothing in her store online. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, I know you're talking about Meredith Marks' son, but for a second, I thought you were going to say Brooks no. Ayers. I was like, Brooks Ayers has a clothing line. Uh, you should have. <laughs> I anyway. also, speaking to tie back quickly to the assistants, one thing I do find interesting, both from Candy and from one Miss Erica Jane Girardi, is that they both have been with their teams for a very, very long time. Like, Don Juan has worked with Candy through the entire time that we've known her on Atlanta. You're about Mikey Minden. And he has worked with Erica the whole time. Okay, well, funny you should bring that up because Let's I have go. a strong theory that there's got to be some dirt on Mikey Minden or there's like an association there and some sort of, there's some some shady dealings. It's giving me Jen Shaw and that assistant. Stuart? Is that his name? Scott? Something like that. Yeah. Either way, like the, it's, it's not coming out in the wash, whatever went on between the two of them. Because I just, I don't believe that the extent of the criminal doings were that extraordinary and that ongoing and that directly funneled into the business. And Mikey is like completely, because the thing is you could be implicated in things you didn't even know you were implicated in. Again, I referenced it in the pilot episode, the amount of people that have copped to just signing things that were put in front of them without reading them Including is the other thing. Including Kyle as of like a couple weeks ago, which yes. by the way, this is okay. So I'm personally, I have never been a fan of Kyle Richards on the show Either give me her fighting with her sisters or get the hell off my TV because all we ever get outside of the compelling sister drama, which I admit is compelling, is Kyle going out of her way to manufacture falsehoods about her life while berating everyone else about not being honest. That's her That's her ongoing theme. And it is making me so truly resentful that we have to now tune into Netflix and buying Beverly Hills where Mauricio is sitting around a table with a bunch of men. I have to watch men now sitting around a table, finally breaking down what happened with Hilton and Highland detail by detail. We're getting that on that show in 13 years. We've never gotten it from Kyle. I hate it. 
Yeah, and he got the juicier conversation with the kids about the divorce. That's also going to be on What is show. happening? I've never felt more betrayed. I have heard fan theories that that's like a parting gift from her to him. I don't understand Barf. why. Barf. I also just like, what is so outrageous to me about their entire thing, and here's the thing, like, I think a lot of these marriages are farces, and that's okay, but at least give us compelling content. Oh, Agree. We put in 13 hard years with you, Kyle, and we can't even get one scene about Hilton and Island. We have to go to Netflix. I want Ramona and Mario level commitment to being on our screen. And then when it falls apart, I would like, they, they gave us a lot when it fell apart. We literally, I mean, you had to watch some deleted scenes and stuff. By the way, did you ever hear this? Jill Zarin gave an interview. Do you know why Mario and Ramona actually finally divorced? No. His mistress was pregnant. Did she have the kid? Does he have another child? I'll let you listen to Jill Saren's interview on that one. But Does no. Avery have a... Okay. okay. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine way. Avery not being an only child anymore. Either way. Like, and that was... And we all remember that Ramona was doing... And we'll get into this in the divorces episode. But we all remember that Mon- Ramona was doing everything to prevent that subject from being covered meaningfully at the season six reunion. Yes. But over the years, we did. We got the juice. We got it. And also, they gave us a fair amount of on-screen time that felt... At some points, deeply uncomfortable. Her giving him a front massage a in her massage. apartment, but also like stroking his chest. It, that was I was cringing so hard watching. Listen, that. I'm gonna just I'm gonna put myself out there in a major way. Mario's hot, so I'm not saying he wasn't. Although the Tom Selleck level chest hair, I could have done without. If we're I don't being mind honest. it, I'm the right guy. I don't mind it. But he seems so uncomfortable. It was almost Tamara and Eddie in a bath level uncomfortable for me personally. So with our last five minutes, we're going to run through our top hustlers. You put this list together. I have some thoughts on it. So let's just no, go down No, I just was quickly. brain dumping. No, I know. I know. But I, let's go through your brain dump. Candy, I think you've already made her case. Yeah. And I agree. I think Candy's probably number one. I'm sorry. Lisa Rinna gets to be number two. That woman is nothing if not a hustler. I don't agree. Okay. Hard disagree because Lisa Rinna's finances appear to be a house of cards that are constantly falling apart. And I actually believe they're like crazy over leveraged on a million schemes we don't even know about that might be true but she is out there hustling <laughs> the qvc of it all top workers all the... maybe but hustlers i don't know okay so at least a top worker that woman is out there and working. she's hustling on the show which made her in my opinion very unpleasant to watch and i have to assume that she's some level of momaging the kids so she at least gets a Chris Jenner kind of cut of their modeling deals. Talk about wild scenes when she's like at the Froyo place with her daughter, just being like, it's so great that you don't have an eating disorder anymore. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Gross. Okay, Portia Williams. Yeah, I'll Why? give it to her. She, again, has a lot of businesses. I'm very curious what's going to happen in this uh, forthcoming divorce. I will say, tying back to the singles, we did get an excellent single from her after her divorce from Cordell Stewart. She is a very good singer. I she feel is. like we forget about that. I'm hoping for a new single to come out. I don't think it will. I, you know, fingers crossed. I do think Portia has had a sad... She's had a not Luann quite level, but not far from... She's had a real evolution. Mm-hmm. We've come a long way from thinking the Underground Railroad was a train. <laughs> yes, we have. Yes, we have. And just the way that she portrays herself now, I think, is very interesting. She has been vulnerable at various points on the show in a way I appreciate, but she's gone through quite a few businesses, Go Naked Hair being one that is still successful and running. That's true. And I feel like she's built, she's on the, what I hope I is not going to age like milk side of doing the influencer thing correctly, as opposed to being a grifter when it comes to really capitalizing on her social media presence too. I agree. I, I'll, I'll give you Portia. Vicky, I think, no question. Yeah. The OG of the OC. Just also, I rewatched the first episode of the whole franchise. Yes, which whew, everyone do yourself a favor and go back and watch because it has some of the darkest lines I think we've ever seen oh, on 100%. any episode. It was and, very much giving pre recession. We were all living. Well, also, Gina Keo basically saying, My husband had several girlfriends like before they got married, and his mom picked me as the one to give the best, the best genetic match. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, dark. But we meet Vicky in her home office in the yep. middle of doing deals, and she is the exact same person 100%. today. And we're all pre-recession rattling around these McMansions full of, you know, they look like they're staged. 
She held hers, though. That's another she big did. thing. She did. They were all a going under, underwater except for her. Yep. So I also respect the fact that she has stayed in the same business, kind of a complete opposite of Wendy from Potomac, who came on as this very kind of credentialed academic, and now all of a sudden, like, what direction are we going, Wendy? Because she has so much potential, but I feel like we're going kind of in the wrong direction with it. I agree. I think... Vicky to me is such a tragic figure because it's it's such an example of like a very specific if Heather is like a quintessential Gen X girl boss like Vicky is a quintessential boomer girl boss mm. where like we needed to hustle at all costs and we tend to forget but her first husband father of, Bri- of, of Brianna and Michael uh, was a complete dilettante deadbeat seemingly alcoholic like he's out of the picture so it was all on on Vicky to generate this lifestyle and she did it but at what cost we say and we look at her love life and we see her love tank is not full it'll never be full it'll never be full but what wouldn't i give what wouldn't i give for one night at Andalays with vicky gungelson listen if i don't get to whoop it up with that woman i need to be dancing on that bar one of my most tragic real life situations is that i apparently was in the same bar as her in park city utah and my cousin told me the next day, did you notice that Vicky Gumvelson was in there when we were walking out? Oh and I God. said, how fucking dare you not have told me that? To me. I was like, I don't even drink tequila anymore. And I would have gone in there and done several shots of tequila with Vicky Gumvelson. You have to. There's no choice. Of course. I was I remember devastated that. to miss that opportunity. Oh, my gosh. Wait. That is so... I remember you told me about this. You were so upset. I was so upset because I went to her Instagram and I was like, there's there's no way. I think I probably like rage texted you about it right after I yelled at my cousin. But I went to her Instagram and be like, no, maybe, no, I think she's wrong. And yeah, she had been there. Could you imagine what it would have been like if you like sent her over like a beautiful, like a little, you know, a little snifter of... She would have come right over. Yep. I 100% believe it. She would have pulled a sombrero out of her purse and walked across that restaurant and started whooping it up. Yeah. Devastating. Anyway. Bethany. We have to give it to Bethany. We don't have to like her. We do. We do. I just, I've never seen someone have so much and still want at such a thirsty, thirsty level. Childhood trauma. Like that uh, truly a, is a childhood I trauma mean, but situation. Sharing a space with her on TikTok, I mean there's there's a lot of jump scares because I don't follow her or anything, but people are frequently stitching her content to be like, this is why this is insane or whatever. And it is like, it is so wild to me to be like, you won. You won at everything. You got what you wanted. You have the m- hundreds of millions. You have the guy. You have what appears to be full custody. You have all these successes under your belt. And we are still out here grinding it out on TikTok. And the thing is, I make TikToks. I enjoy the platform. But I'm not out here fighting with random people 24-7 and giving out ED advice. Also, what happened to Be Strong? Why didn't we just pivot back to that? I don't know. Not enough glory in it? Because that was nice to see for a while. There was like a brief period on the show where I was like, yes. Oh, my God. I just watched literally yesterday the episode where we're in that restaurant before going to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico with Dorinda. We're getting to Dorinda in the divorce episode, but. It's dark. How do you. That's just the thing with Dorinda to me that I'm like, how do you watch these? Do you? So there's also one where we need her to be sober on our shows. That, That goes against our earlier statement. Yes, she's one of the few people where I'm like, actually, this is bad. Yes. This is like, and the thing is, like, obviously, there's like the old school, like, I made it nice, clip, clip, whatever. But once yeah. we got to season 12, that turkey baster comment, as someone who does not want children, I was like, that is the most horrendous thing I think I've ever heard one person say to another who you know is like in the very waning years of fertility and desperately wants a child. Like, that was. And I think she was pretty sober during that. I think we were one or two margaritas in. Yes. Also, the comment around, I don't think kids from Haiti are going to college. The way that line was delivered was very uncomfortable. Richard gave millions. You can't help these people. Like, it was so... And you know what it was about that particular scene that was so gross, aside from, like, how embarrassing and cringy it was, was, like what are the sober conversations that she had with Richard that are like being like dispersed in fragments from her mind? Because Mm -hmm. you know, whatever like bootstrap, weird, libertarian, global, like, you know, some weird stuff went into her mind to come out like that. Do you know what I mean? Like what was Richard saying around the fire? 
with a snifter of brandy in his hand. I do not know, but I think we got a glimpse. We got a glimpse. It, it was very much giving like what what like one billionaire would say to another on the Titanic about like sub-Saharan Africa. Do you know what I'm saying? Like they're in like the cigar room. Like they're talking about. I'm like, oh, we just hit something. <laughs> it's, yeah. Don't worry, we'll get a lifeboat. Um, and then last but not least, and we will talk about her extensively on our divorce episode for obvious reasons, Teresa Judice. Listen, the woman is a hustler. Yeah. I'm not saying she's a genius. <laughs> I do give her respect, though, for coming out on the other side of not reading a document and signing it and then going to jail. That's not think... why she went to jail, though. No, I know. She, because she was being so flagrant in front of the judge. She well, could have stayed out of jail. Well, and also, though, I do... This is going to sound really disrespectful. I don't know her intelligence level, but I think she was going to sign it whether or not she read it. I don't think that really has to do with it. I think it's okay to say that we don't think Teresa is the most cognitively advanced person on these franchises. Yes. But she did come out. She knew they had restitution to pay. I believe she paid every penny of it herself. Correct. She kept the kids in whatever House of Cards McMansion they were in <laughs> for a very long time. I lost an immense amount of respect for her when she married Louie without a prenup. Even Andy Cohen was trying to get her to have a prenup with Louie. But she is a hard worker. Like, say what you will about the intelligence level and all of that, but I do feel like she's a hard worker. I don't think she always makes the best decisions with her businesses. As you know, my mother is from a large New Jersey Italian family. Having a lot of members of my extended family that are very much giving Teresa and many disputes amongst the various branches of the family that are very much giving Teresa and Melissa. There's something deeply triggering to me about it. And there is something so that I so deeply resent. It's a very anti-Vicky sort of situation where it's like you, for whatever your shortcomings may be, you have all of this, but you will throw it away at the at a wink from a disgusting man, (laughs) a greasy, greasy man. Yes, but the only thing I will say that's interesting to me about her coming out and of jail and handling all the restitution and all of that is that she was very much raised from what we've seen to basically just be a breeder and a homemaker. Like Not there was, a breeder, honey. That is <laughs> how I feel word. like she was raised. Yes. Like, I think that the culture... Yeah, I think the culture she was raised in was basically like, you have two functions. It is to cook and it is to bear children. And Mm -hmm. the fact that she also, to a degree, had to overcome her socialization to be like, no, I can work and I can make money and I can do this thing. But you are correct that she immediately gave, surrendered her power as soon as somebody's like, I'll marry you. If you're the woman who's going to be going for a vineyard romp with your husband not 20 seconds after he's on the phone with his mistress, I mean, good Lord. (laughs) Good Lord. Okay, who else would you like to throw in here? I think you made a really compelling list. I think the only one maybe I'm not seeing on this list that I would want to. I mean, I think a lot of Lisa Vanderpump's endeavors are very sketchy and we're not sure the financing of it. And I don't, it it also gives House of Cards to me. Um, But I would say Lisa Vanderpump's got to be in there. I think... I think there's also a a profound amount of sketchiness on the part of her husband. I've I've dove into that a few times on other podcasts, but I think Nicole in Miami is a hustler for sure. Yeah, Um, which is interesting though, because she, again, I, I didn't include her in the big roundup because we haven't known her for long enough, but... Coming in with a very stable, credible career, mm-hmm. continues to work that job. We don't see a ton of it on the show, but we see enough that it's like, yes, she is a doctor and she goes to a hospital and yes. she does her job. Yes. Yes. Yes, I, I totally agree. Well, you know what? There's been real businesses. There's been fake businesses. There's been businesses that never even existed. But one thing there's been <laughs> is businesses. <laughs> And we're so sorry we couldn't share more. They're just... There's just so many. Um, but a lot of this we'll also touch on briefly in the uh, next episode, uh, Marriages and Divorces. Um, until next time, guys. Bye. <laughs> Keep it classy. Keep it classy. <laughs> Bye.